Good evening, everybody, and um, welcome back. Those of you who are, have been with the other two lectures and also well, welcome if any of you are new here for the first time. So as you know, our lecture series is called Generative Discipleship, The Deeper Secrets Inside the Gospels. And um, this is the third in that part. The first week we did the Synoptic Gospels. Last week we did St. John's Gospels at Gospel. And tonight I wanna do, um, I call two particular invitations to maturity and adult discipleship in, in scripture. And um, we'll look at that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start the, our, our, the PowerPoint so you can see the outline. And uh, so give me just 30 seconds to do this. And uh, so we're lecture three, two particular invitations to ponder and to bless. Just a, a short word of introduction. You know, um, there are, are, are there, there's different levels of invitation in scripture. Some invitations invite us to initial conversion. Some invite us to uh, give our lives away more deeply. And then some kind of ask you about like, what, to, to really move to, to a, a deeper invitation, yet a, a imitation of Jesus. I want to give you two of these. I call them, and they're the hallmarks, I believe, of both Christian and human maturity. In the book I wrote, Sacred Fire, um, these are the last two chapters in the book uh, before I go into the, the, I have a, a chapter for the next book in terms of giving your death away, but in terms of giving your life away, said the two ultimate adult discipleship invitations are the invitation to hold, carry, and transform tension and the invitation to bless. Let me begin with the first one. Um, the invitation to hold, carry, and transform tension, which you're going to see. I want to give you one of the images of scripture. It's the image of Mary. They say, Mary pondered these things in her heart. Okay. Um, and I want to give you kind of a little hermeneutic here from Richard Rohr, which I want to come back to. Richard says, whatever tension we don't transform, we will retransmit. That's an important statement. Any tension that comes into us, if we don't transform that tension, we're going to transmit that tension. So I just hold that in your back of your minds as, as we go into this. The invitation to ponder, which is to hold, carry, and transform tension for the community. Now let's just begin with a definition of, you know, um, in scripture, they use that word about Mary. They say, Mary pondered these things in her heart at critical times when the Annunciation of the Angel Gabriel comes, when she's with um, um, old Zachariah and he says, a sword is going to pierce your heart and so on. Or when Jesus, the, 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 the young Jesus tells her, you know, I have to be about my father's business. Now, now what does it mean to ponder? Now, here we have to do a, a shift um, because the way we think of the word pondering in all of our Western languages is not the what it's meant in scripture. You know, um, we think in Greek software. Our Western language is really the software we think in is Greek. Okay. And see, for us as Greek, uh, as Greeks in that sense, to ponder means to think deep thoughts. Like I quote you Socrates here. Socrates says, the unexamined life is not worth living. That's a Greek speaking, you know. So for us to ponder, imagine you're trying to think something through and you take direction from people, you do some journaling, you pray about it, you're trying to think it through. That's pondering in the Greek sense. That's not what Mary did. Okay. Mary was a Hebrew. And in Hebrew, the word ponder meant this, to hold, carry, and transform tension so as not to give it back in kind, knowing that whatever you don't transform, you will retransmit. Let me tease that out. And I want to begin with just a basic image of Mary, okay? And that is Mary under the cross in John's gospel. John's gospel, John says, when Jesus was dying, his mother, Mary, another Mary, and the disciple whom John loved, uh, Jesus loved, 
were standing under the cross. So as he's dying, his mother is standing under the cross. Now it's very interesting. What is she doing under the cross? Well, you see overtly, she isn't doing anything. Notice she's not trying to stop the crucifixion. She's not protesting the crucifixion. She's not even protesting her son's innocence. She's not saying the other two guys are guilty, he's innocent. She's silent, she's silent now. But it's, it's, it's in the language. First of all, they said she stood. She stood under the cross. In Hebrew, to stand is a position of strength, which means Mary was strong under the cross. Sometimes artists get this wrong. They show Mary kind of the women, they're prostrate under the cross, you know. But prostration is, 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 is a, it, it, that's a collapse. That's a, that's a, you know, a, a, that's a collapse. It's not a strength. You know, he said she stood, she was strong. Now, what was she doing under the cross? Overtly, nothing. She wasn't trying to stop the crucifixion. She wasn't protesting it. She wasn't protesting her son's innocent. Innocence, what was she doing? She was pondering the Greek sense. She was holding, carrying, and transforming tension so as not given back in kind. Now, that's abstract. What does that mean? It means this. When Mary was standing under the cross, she was doing the only thing she could on that day. She was, um, you know, Jesus said, sometimes darkness just has its hour. You know, you know what Mary's doing under the cross? She's saying, today I can't stop the crucifixion. Nobody can. But I can stop some of the anger, the bitterness, the jealousy that, ca that causes crucifixion. How? By absorbing it, by eating it, by not giving it back in kind. You'd see it in the opposite. Imagine if Mary had been under the cross, just shouting at people, you're all terrible people, you're murdering my son, you're bad people, you know. She'd have been replicating the very energy that causes crucifixions and giving it back, you know. Incidentally, those of us who work in any kind of justice, whether you're from the left or from the right, um, this is a big problem. So many times in our protests, you know what we're doing? We're replicating the very energy that we're fighting and giving it back. We're, we're transmitting energy rather than, um, than transforming it. To give you an example, you know, we still do uh, executions in Texas. And if you go to Huntsville, when, when somebody's being executed by the state, uh, very few people are in the actual room where it's happening, but there'll be people in the courtyard and there'll be three kinds of people, you know? There'll be people who are protesting for this. They're saying this, we need to execute this person. We're bringing justice and they have banners you know, or, or, or placards, you know, this is justice for the family. This is closure. Then you have other people protesting against them. We're saying we're just as much murderers as he is. But then off in the corner, you have Sister Helen Prejohn, a couple of Catholic sisters, maybe one or two other people. They're standing silently with candles, praying. They're saying nothing. They're, that's Mary under the cross. They're saying, today we can't stop this execution. At this stage, nobody can but we can stop some of the anger, the bitterness, the murders, kind of angers and tensions that cause this, how? By absorbing it. Notice they take in the hatred, the bitterness, but they don't give it back, you know? See, that's the image of pondering, okay. Now, we understand a lot of things by their opposite. So just to, to tease this out. So in, in scripture, in, in, in the gospels, the opposite of pondering is not to not ponder. They don't say Mary pondered and the other people didn't ponder. The opposite of pondering is something they call amazement, being amazed. You know how often you hear in scriptures that Jesus did this and the crowd was amazed. And almost immediately Jesus says, don't be amazed. Amazement is not a good thing. Because you know what amazement is? It's the very opposite of this. See, amazement, a crowd, a crowd just conducts energy. Crucify him, crucify him, you know, um, and, and so on. Or today we have our own crowds. Lock her up. That, that's, that's the energy of amazement. It's not thought out. It's mindless. You know, it's interesting. I, I told you this the last time in one of the lectures that in the Gospels, in all of the Gospels, almost every time the word crowd is used, it's used pejoratively. It's used negatively. You know, crowds, 
are dangerous. You know, the same crowd that on Sunday afternoon or Sunday morning is telling Jesus, you know, they're saying, make him king, be our king. By Friday afternoon, they're saying they're, they're, the same crowd is chanting, crucify him, crucify him. See, amazement is like the electrical wire. I'm going to give you that image. See, you know, electrical wire simply conducts what goes into it. 110 volts in, 110 volts out. 220 volts in, 220 volts out. Crowds do that. We do this, you know. Um, and we just, we just, we conduct, you know, people hate us, we hate them. People like us, we like them. So it's said become, become a simple conduit for either virtue or crucifixion. An unwillingness to carry and transform tension. Incidentally, this is this next piece here. That's a very important text in scripture and we generally miss it. Okay, where and it's part of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says to the scribes and Pharisees, or people, he says, unless your virtue goes deeper than that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we tend to misunderstand that because we think of the scribes and Pharisees as hypocritical and fighting with Jesus. But no, most of the scribes and Pharisees were very good religious people. Jesus was a Pharisee, you know. Those were the church-going good people of the time, and they had a high virtue. Notice Jesus says, not talking here about hypocrisy, see, their virtue, and their virtue was a high virtue. The virtue of the scribes and Pharisees of Judaism at the time was this. You had to keep all the Ten Commandments, and you had to be a woman or a man of justice. So you had to be absolutely fair in your dealings, and you had to keep all the Ten Commandments. And Jesus said, that's not enough. Why would that not be enough? He said, you have to go beyond that. Why? Because you can still do that out of amazement. See, because Jesus goes further. He says, anybody can love those who love you. Anybody can hate those who hate you. Anybody can bless those who bless you. Just as anybody can curse those who curse you. Notice that's the electrical wire. Someone can love me and says, I think you're wonderful. Well, then I want to think you're wonderful. Someone comes up to me and says, you're, you're a charlatan. I wish you'd die. And I said, well, you're a charlatan too, you know, or you know, you're the best priest we've ever had. You're the best parishioners I've ever had. You're the worst priest we ever had. Well, you're the worst parishioners I ever had. Notice th th there's no virtue in that ultimately. It's not that it doesn't, you know, you know, uh, that we can do good things, but notice Jesus says, my law is you got to love those who hate you. You have to do good to those who curse you. You know, you have to love and forgive an enemy. Incidentally, that particular part of scripture is the deepest moral part of scripture. You know, when you're looking for a litmus test for Christianity, don't look to moral issues like abortion or whatever. You know, look at this. Can you love an enemy? Can you love and forgive somebody who kills you? What Jesus did, you know. See, that's where Jesus stretches us further than any other moral teacher. And uh, see, but you don't do this by being amazed. You only do it by transforming tension. Now, because um, I, I don't, I want to, don't, I don't want to spend too much time on this and give some time for discussion afterwards on this and and also on blessing. So, what's the lesson? What's the challenge? The challenge is, it, it is to to do this, and this is the way it acts. So, even example. See the, the image of amazement is the image of an electrical wire. The image of pondering is the image of a water purifier. Now it's not a great image, it's mechanical, but it works. You know, what does a water purifier do? It takes in water, and the water has toxins in it, it has impurities, it has poisons, it's that dirt. And the water purifier simply holds the dirt holds the toxins, holds the impurities, and gives you back just the pure water. That's what pondering does. That, uh, that's what Jesus did. Incidentally, you know, when we, as Christians, which is a metaphor, we say, behold the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How did Jesus take away the sin of the world? Well, we have all our metaphors and images and so on. We, he paid the price to the Father by his blood. We have been washed clean and so on. 
Those are metaphors. Jesus wasn't a sheep. He was a person, you know, and God isn't bought off by, you know, you have a grudge against us and Jesus suffered. And now God forgives us. None of that. Jesus did it by transformation. So I'll just give you these, these next five bullet points. You have it, you know. Um, Jesus took in hatred and he held it and he gave back love. See, he took the sin out of the world. Jesus took in curses. He held them, gave back blessing. He took curses out of the world. He took in bitterness. He held it, transformed it, and gave back graciousness. He took bitterness out. He took in jealousy. He held it, transformed it, transformed it, and gave back affirmation. He took jealousy out. He took in murder. He held it, transformed it, and gave back forgiveness. See, you take away the sin of the world, not through some magical act and so on, by simply by eating it. He literally ate the sin, but gave back something else. Took in hatred, gave back love. Took in curses, gave back blessing. That's what a water purifier does. See, that's what Mary is doing under the cross. You know, that's what Mary is doing when she's pondering. That, and that's what we're asked to do as adults. This is a standing invitation to us as adults that, um, you know, I, I quote Bonhoeffer here, and, and I love this uh, expression, um, pardon me, that it, it's Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard said, Jesus wants followers, not admirers, you know, and too often, um, sorry, that, that should be Kierkegaard, that's not Bonhoeffer, I'm going to quote Bonhoeffer later. Okay. Jesus wants followers, not admirers. Um, that, that, that's Kierkegaard. So we're asked to imitate that. You know, it's not something we admire and say, isn't it wonderful that Jesus did this for us? You know, no, that's an invitation. And that's an invitation to, to adults. You know, that, that, that's the ultimate invitation for a community. See, you know what you need to give your community? You need to be that water purifier. Where you see, the anger stops here. The hatred stops here. The curses stop here. The bitterness stops with me, the jealousy stops with me, the murderousness stops with me. I take it in, I give back something else. You take it out of the community. And I dare say that today in our communities, you know, we were so divided and anger. It's just that this, for instance, election coming up, there's so much toxic anger all over. Um, we can't talk to each other. Our task is to absorb that, to not give it back in kind. Whatever we don't transform, we will retransmit. Just two quick caveats on that before I move on. And one of them is that in the name of that, though, don't absorb abuse. That's something else. You know, this is where the church in the past made, you know, we weren't astute enough. The church had a kind of a, a theology of this, the spirituality about, you know, you 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 uh, love absorb stuff, but at times we would. We, we got it wrong because we would absorb abuse and say, you know, like, yeah, the woman stay with your abusive husband. That's your way of loving him. Today we say, no, no, that's, you're not taking away the sin that you're, you're enabling the sin. So you don't absorb abuse. This has to be done in love. And then secondly, it's an invitation. This is not a command. Notice I've never used the word, it's not a deception. This is an invitation to, to do when you're ready, you know, if you're not ready to do this, we can't do it. And you know how we know when we're ready or not? When we can do it without resentment. You know, a lot of times, interesting, most of us are really good people. And you know what we're going to do? We're actually going to do this, except we're going to do it with resentment. When I was a young priest at a wonderful old sister who was my spiritual director, and she really pushed me, but she had a beautiful expression. She always said, when you carry somebody's cross, don't send them the bill. When you carry somebody's cross, don't send them the bill. Jesus carried that cross. There was no money, no price. So sometimes we do this to people, but then we hold subtly hold them hostage. Look how much I've done for you. You know, see, and then we also we, we also get resentful. People are taking advantage of me. You know, that's a natural feeling. But see, then we're not ready. Um, you know, Jesus didn't get resentful that they killed him. Um, so, so that's the first one. We can come back and talk about that during the, the, the question period and so on or the discussion. So the invitation to hold, carry, and transform tension for our communities.
The second one is the invitation to bless others. The invitation to bless others. Now, I'm going to lead into this. What is a blessing? What is a blessing? Well, you know, especially those of you who are Roman Catholics, um, we bless everything. Every Mass ends with a blessing. I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We bless rosaries. We bless statues. We bless fields. We bless weddings. We bless things. Okay, we bless houses and so on. What, what is a blessing? Well, I want to lead into but tell, tell you a couple of stories of non-blessing. When I was a young priest, in fact, it was my very first year ordained, and it was the, the Sunday where we celebrate the baptism of our Lord. Um, that's the Sunday after, after Epiphany. You know, right, we have Christmas, Holy Family, Epiphany. Then the next Sunday, the church is called the baptism of our Lord. It kind of kicks off Christ's ministry. And it's a beautiful story. It's told in all the Gospels, um, where Jesus comes to be baptized by John the Baptist in the desert. And they said, John immersed Jesus' head in the water. And then, you know, they used to do baptism by immersion. So the whole head would be underwater. So when the head comes out, it breaks the water. See, it's, it's a symbol of new birth. So when a baby comes out of the womb of his mom, it, it breaks the mother's waters. So it's a symbol of rebirth. So Jesus' head came out of the water. They said, and then the voice from heaven, God said, this is my beloved. And the Greek word there is blessed. This is my blessed one in whom I take delight. Or at one point he says, in whom I am well pleased. This is my blessed one in whom I take delight. Well, I was preaching in the church in Edmonton and um, didn't have much, I don't know, didn't know where, where I go with this homily. So I said this, it was the Saturday evening mass. I said, you know, most of us were asleep to our own baptism. We were infants, so we don't remember it, you know. But just as surely as God said those words over Jesus, you're my beloved, my blessed one, in you I take delight, in you I am well pleased. I said, they were spoken over us. God spoke those words over us. Well, I was in the sacristy afterwards investing, and this young man came in, a guy in his mid-20s, quite agitated, you know. And uh, he said, Father, Father, he said, I, I, um, I came here tonight to this Mass. Haven't been for a long time. He said, because I'm out on bail, and Monday I'm going to get my sentencing, and I'm probably going to go to prison for two years. He said, so I came here tonight because I thought this would steady me. He said, but it didn't. It, it made everything worse. He said, because what you said, it's not true. It's not true. He said, nobody has ever been pleased by what I've done, least of all my own father. So I said, nobody's ever been pleased by what I've done, least of all my own father. It's no accident this young man's going to prison. Never been blessed by his father. You know, I'm going to talk about that later on. But that, that puts a band around, but there's, there's a, a birth band we're born with that can only be taken off by blessing. It wasn't ever taken off this young man, and so on. The other one comes from the, the great prophet of our time, Daniel Berrigan. Now, Berrigan was just, you know, one of the, the true prophets of our time. But Berrigan, he was always out of sync with every authority, whether it was the government, his provincial, the pope, whoever um, Berrigan had trouble with. And it, it, it also made him a very prophetic figure. But later on, when he was already in his 80s, he wrote his autobiography. And he says, you know something? He says, Philip, his brother said, Philip and I were never blessed by our father. He said, my mother blessed us. He said, my mother told me all times, Daniel, God, I'm proud of you. He said, my father, he said, he couldn't bless us. He was jealous of our energy, of our intelligence. He said, if I wrote a book, I couldn't even tell him about it. He'd get jealous. He said, I should have written this book. Then he said, is it any wonder that I've been a pain in the side of every patriarchal figure during my whole life? You know, he was dealing with his father, never been blessed by his father. Okay, so what is a blessing? Well, I'm gonna unpackage it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, sorry, you got Bonhoeffer before that's supposed to be Kierkegaard. Bonhoeffer said, a blessing is a visible, perceptible, effective proximity of God. Now that kind of says it all, but it needs a lot of unpackaging. Like I said, we're familiar with a ritual blessing. A blessing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay. There's other ritual blessings. You know, um, I lived in Belgium for three years. Belgium is a Catholic country. Not many people go to church, but it's Catholic. And uh, the young people there, 
their parents would bless them, you know, at, at the beginning of every week. You know, the kids would set off for university and their parents would simply trace the sign of the cross on their forehead, you know, would bless them. I grew up in a Germanic thing and, and my parents blessed me once. But it's, it's the morning you leave home, like the morning I left for the seminary if my brothers and sisters leave for university, when you leave home, they would do a ritual blessing. You know, where I knelt down on the old linoleum floor and they put their hands on my head and said a prayer, you know. They died a couple of years later, it meant a lot to me, you know. But it was a ritual blessing which was meant to convey some, a lot more, to convey more than just that, that ritual. Now, those of you who still know Latin, you know, and if not, you can learn two words here. Uh, in Latin, they would begin the blessing with the words bene dicere, bene dicere, and bene is the Latin word for good, for well, and dicere is to speak, and that captures it. To speak well of somebody is to bless them. You can have to say, I, I think you're a wonderful person. I'm glad when you come to a room, you bring a wonderful energy into a room. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. You're speaking well of them. You can see that's the opposite of a curse. Now, it's interesting, both of the testaments of Scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Jewish Scriptures and the Christian Scriptures, they open with a major blessing, and the blessing sets the tone for the rest of Scripture. So if you go to the Old Testament, we call the Old Testament the Jewish Scriptures, okay? And you look at the Genesis story, the creation of the world, and notice in there, God does something already. The first day he said, let there be light and light and darkness separated from each other. And God saw what he had done and God saw that it was good. The second day, it was good. Third day, so it was good. And then it says, after God had done everything, made all the planets and the plants and the human beings that God looked at everything he had done and he saw that it was very good. That's the original blessing, and that's never been taken away. That's where Matthew Fox was 100% right. You know, the original blessing was not done away with by original sin. Well, depends, I guess, your denomination. Incidentally, that is one of the dividing points in theology between Roman Catholics and Protestants, okay? Roman Catholics and Pres uh, uh, Anglicans, we believe that the original blessing was not taken away by original sin. It was flawed, but not taken away. Whereas Luther, Kelvin, and Swingley said, no, that original sin corrupted nature and so on. Okay. But I'm a Roman Catholic. You know, that, that blessing is still there. God is still looking at us and saying, it's good. It's good. Look in our world. Then we see the text that just talked about the baptism of Jesus, you know, where he comes out of the water. He's being born again. You know, and the heavens open up and it says, this is my beloved. And I said, beloved in, in Greek, that's the word blessed. This is my blessed child in whom I take delight, in whom I am well pleased. Now, that's like Jesus' ordination. Notice that, that the baptism of Jesus, it, it separates his private life. You know, his, his what we call, which we don't know anything about, his, 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 his life up until his ministry. Jesus lived for 33 years, but we only know things about the last three years of his life, other than a couple of little details before, you know, and it's, that's when he goes public, but he goes public. It's almost like somebody being ordained or consecrated in his baptism, you know, but scholars will tell you this, and it's very, very important that this sets Jesus' consciousness. Jesus hears, you're my beloved, you're my blessed one in whom I take you. So that um, for, to, to understand Jesus, you have to understand that for, for the rest of his life, it's almost like he's hearing his, his father say in his ear, you're my blessed one. You are my, in you I take delight, you're blessed. And that's why Jesus could look out at the world and say, you know, blessed are you when you're poor. Blessed are you when you're meek. Blessed are you all the beatitudes come out of that. You know, that isn't easy to do, to look out and say, you're blessed, you're the speaker. See, Jesus had a blessed consciousness. Um, now, I want to explain, before I even define blessing, I want to explain that the opposite of blessing. The opposite of blessing is a curse. Okay. And what is a curse? Okay. Bless those who curse you. Okay. Now, first of all, a curse is not, 
the, 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 the foul language that comes out of our mouth sometimes when we get frustrated, we get caught in traffic or we hit our hand with a hammer or, you know, whatever, we slice our golf ball wrong or we just, our computer breaks down and we lose the day's work. Some colorful language comes out of our mouth, but that's not a curse. You know, as a priest, sometimes people come out of confessional, they say, Father, I cursed and I swore. I always thought, well, you have used some colorful language, but that's, that's not cursing or swearing. And also what I'd like to say, but I can't say, I would say, I'd like to say, also I said, that's not a Catholic sin. That's a Protestant evangelical sin. You know, if you're a Protestant or an evangelical, that could be a sin for a Catholic, it's not, you know. Um, no, but that's not a curse. That's just, that it, it might be wrong in terms of its aesthetics, but it's not, that's not what a curse is. This is a curse. Anthropologists say, you know what the, what, what the prototype of a curse is this, is that imagine this picture, a little child in a high chair, the kid's a year old, year and a half old, and little kids after they eat, they spontaneously fuel up. And this kid starts throwing jello and food around the room and shouting, enjoy. And some adult said, shut up, stop that, stop it. Okay, that's a curse. And that's a thousand times worse than what you do when you get caught in a traffic jam and use some foul language. Because note if you, you've just done the very opposite of God. God is looking at the young planet spinning off mud, splitting planets and saying, it's good, it's good. That energy is good. The father's looking at Jesus, head coming out of the water, said, it's good, it's very good. He didn't say, Jesus, stop it. I don't want your energy and so on. See, that, that's a curse. And you know what it does? It forms our, our consciousness. So that after all, we have a cursed consciousness. The same as Jesus had a blessed consciousness. You know, what's a cursed consciousness? I'll tell you a couple of little stories and I'll, I'll, I'll um, try to define it more, more technically. But, <clears throat> you know, in, in all philosophy schools and in all major religions, we have the same axiom where we say that you don't really see what's outside of yourself, but we project, we see what's inside of ourselves, we project it out. That's why three people looking at the same thing, three see three different things. You know, we project out, you know. Um, in Thomistic philosophy, they used to have, it, it, even in Latin, it really had a nice little clip to it. They said, you know, quid quid recipitor, at modem recipientis recipitor. Whatever is received is received according to the mode of the receiver. Now, I'll tell you what that means. These are the colorful stories. This comes from Buddhism. And the Buddhists have a, have a parable. They said one day the Buddha was sitting under a tree. And as you know, the Buddha is always fat. So you have this fat Buddha sitting under a tree and a young trim soldier walks by, looks at the Buddha and he says, you look like a pig. And the Buddha looked at him calmly and said, and you look like God. So this surprised the soldier. He said, why would you say I look like God? And the Buddha said, well, you know, we don't see what's out there. We see what's inside of ourselves and we project it out. And I think, sit under a tree all day, I think about God. So when I look out, that's what I see. And you must be thinking about other things. It's quite a caustic thing. When I look out, I said, you're... You're fat like a pig. You're an idiot. This guy's full of himself. We're talking about ourselves, you know. Um, one of my colleagues here says, you go to work in the morning. If the first five people you meet are stupid idiots, there's a very good chance that you're the stupid idiot. And that's what we're seeing. Or my, my brother, who's a farmer, he has this joke. Same moral. He says this, this grandfather, he had a five-year-old granddaughter. And every Saturday morning, he'd take her out for ice cream. He'd pick her up, take her out for ice cream, and she had her hour with grandpa and was fun, you know. So one Saturday morning, he couldn't make it. So grandma came and took the young girl out for ice cream. And they came back and they said to the little girl, well, how was it with grandma? And she said, well, it wasn't as much fun, you know. She said, it's more fun to go with grandpa. She said, because grandma's so nice, she just talks to everybody. Grandpa points out who all the idiots and jerks are, you know. Well, grandpa's got a cursed consciousness. See, when we're looking at we say, like, um, he's an idiot. She's full of herself. Who does he think he is? That's cursed consciousness. And you know why we do it? Because we've been cursed. You know, if we, if we could play our life back like a video, and you could see, especially when you're very young, from the time you're in, you're in, in the high chair, 
you know, until you get into your teen years where you're young and then you, you know, you're, you're not strong enough to protect yourself and so on. The number of times that you've been cursed or said, stop it, shut up, grow up, just, you know, don't eat like a little pig and so on. See, uh, and, and we get shamed and cursed and so on. And then we inhale that. And then that's the way we see the world, which is the opposite of the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when you're poor. Bless your energy when it's wonderful, instead of who does he think he is, and so on. And you know what happens? Then when we reach adulthood, most adults in most cultures, you know, anthropologists will tell you this, most adults, as most of us, we live in a certain chronic depression, not clinical depression, that's a disease, chronic depression. And chronic depression is this, that there isn't a lot of delight in our lives. And have to define delight is not what we often think it is. So delight is not the bravado we work at at a party where you say, I want to have a good time tonight if it kills me. Uh, that's just, that's not. First of all, real delight has to find you. We can't create it. We can create it for some other buddy, somebody else, but you cannot create delight in your life. It has, it has to find you, you know. You know where you still see delight? You see the little kids. If you go to a playground where little kids are playing and just listen to their voices, kids coming out of the recess and they're just shrieking, you know, yeah, they're playing on the swings and so on. Um, they're, 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 their energy is free and it's, it's delight. They haven't been cursed into, into depression yet as we have, you know. Um, but you ask yourself, you know, or I put it this way, you know, you or I, we can be a good, you know, faithful, generous, you know, altruistic adult and work for other people and be a very good person and go through 20 years of our lives and never have a thimble full of genuine delight. We're doing it. We're doing it. You know, this would be delight. Imagine you're walking to your car some night, just an ordinary Monday evening, nothing special, but you feel your body, you sense your life, you sense your energy and you just say to yourself, God, it feels great to be alive. We've experienced delight. But you know, we can go through 20 years and never have a moment like that. You know, I want to tell you how we how create that moment, you know, through blessing. You know, see, the cursedness that we've experienced in life has dampened that energy. We're not like little kids anymore. We can't just shriek in the sun. Okay. Now, as I want to suggest in a few minutes, the way out of this depression is through blessing others. Now, I first want to define what is a blessing, okay? The blessing has three elements, as you can see here, okay? First of all, blessing is to see and admire a person and to see and admire really their energy. You know, that, that sounds so obvious, but it isn't. You know, we, we, we are rarely seen and we rarely see others. You know who we see when we enter a room? We see the people we really love and the people we really hate and everybody else's wallpaper, you know, but to be seen by somebody where someone comes to say, God, I'm glad you're in this room. And I'm glad at your energy. I'm just, I'm, I'm it's just this wonderful person, you know, doesn't happen very often, you know, um, you know, to be seen. Anthropologists study this, you know, both positively and negatively. Let me give you a couple of experiences or examples, you know, some years ago, some family friends of mine, a couple, they broke up and they had an 11 year old girl, Amy, the daughter. She was living with her mom and her dad would pick her up, you know, you have Saturdays with her or whatever. And he thought he was seeing her. He was to pick her up and take her a movie and pizza and so on. But one day this 11 year old girl went to the shop and she shoplifted an item that she didn't want, didn't need, wasn't showing off to anybody and got caught. And so the security people bring her in, they say, you know, they want to teach her a little lesson. So they say, we're going to have to make your, who, who do you live with? So I live with mom. We're going to make your mom come down here and pick you up, you know? So she said, I don't want my mom to pick me up. And she gave him a phone number and said, this is my dad's number. I want him to come and pick me up. Notice, you don't have to have a degree in psychology to understand what's happening. She's forcing her father to see her. He thought he was. He was. You know, they, 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 there's, there's, Many blessings in just in being seen. Just give you small examples. You know, you know what happens when you go to a really good restaurant, and that's why it's a really good restaurant. 
halfway through your meal, the owner comes out and greets you. Where are you from? Well, we're in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Well, I thought they had a football team there once. And, you know, the, the talk is useless, but you know, it was a good restaurant. The owner saw you. Doesn't matter whether he's a mafia guy. He owns the restaurant. <laughs> he is coming. And that's why people want to have their picture taken with the Pope, with the Queen, with celebrities. They want to be seen. There's something healthy to that. You know? So the first element of a blessing is to see somebody. Secondly is to speak well of them. And that doesn't have to be in language, because oftentimes our language lies, you know. Some of you come in the room and says, God, I'm glad to see you. Say, no, you're not. You prefer I'm dead, you know. Uh, but you come in and say, well, your person, your energy brings delight to that person. So they say, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. You know, and oftentimes our very gifts um, are, 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 are what work against us. So for instance, a very beautiful, attractive woman, you know something? A lot of times um, she's going to suffer, you know. Her energy threatens most people in that room, you know. They don't say, God, I'm glad, you know. Uh, well, no, no. She must have had some body work done and all kinds of stuff like that, you know, so, or, or any, anybody who's, who energy threatens other people out of jealousy and out of many things and so on. But if you can, I'm giving examples of that for you. If you can just genuinely speak well of somebody, see their energy, see their person, admire them. And that, that's already a mini blessing. A major blessing is the third thing. If you add the third thing, you give your life so that some of, so that, they might have more life. Let me give an example of that. I will give you two examples, one from scripture and one from the world of art. You know, in, in, in the gospel of Luke and the Christmas story, Luke must have been an anthropologist. He writes this up with incredible archetypal imagery and his energy of the wise men, the, the, the magi. And notice the magi, they see the star. And so they follow the star and they come to the crib and there lies the young king. So what do they do? They leave their gifts at the foot of the king. And what happens to them afterwards? We don't know. It's not important. They say, we can go away now and die. We're in really good hands. This kid has taken over. And Herod, how much to the contrary? King Herod. King Herod is a king born, but I'm a king. There's no room for two kings. That I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. And in trying to kill him, he kills all the boy babies in the whole area, you know, everybody under two years old. You know, anthropologists write books about that. You know, that's archetypal. <laughs> they always say, fish aren't the only species that eats their young. We do it. We are so threatened by that energy, you know. See, the wise men, they lay their energy at the foot of the child and they go away. It's his show. Herod, I'm going to kill him because he's going to take my power, my energy, and so on. Now, the, the example here I really like is from, from the, the, the musical Les Miserables. If you ever saw the movie Les or the, the movie or the play Les Miserables, which is a beautiful thing altogether, but there's just one very poignant moment in there where old John Valjean goes to the barracks to bless young Marius. Now, he's an old man, and the only joy he has still in his life is his adopted daughter, but he realizes this young man's going to marry his daughter and take him away. It's going to be the last joy he has left. So this young man's one heck of a threat to him. So what does he do? He goes to the barracks to just to see what this young boy looks like. And when he gets there, he finds him asleep. But he finds him asleep in a double way. He's physically asleep. But he's also asleep to the fact that tomorrow he's going to get killed. You know, the French guard are going to kill these schoolboys in 15 minutes, you know. So what does he do? He prays this beautiful prayer over the over the, the young boy. And if you if you've ever seen the, the musical, it's a beautiful prayer. He begins to God on high. He said, Hear my prayer. He said, Look at this young man. He's young. He's afraid. And tomorrow he's gonna die. So he says to God, do this. He said, I'm old. Take my life and let him live. He's young. He should live. Take my life and let him live. That becomes the refrain for the song. Let him live. Let me die. You know, I'm old. I can die. He's young. He should have life. See, that's true maturity. 
that's ultimate maturity, that's ultimate blessing. I want to give you two images here before I go into the, the last part and just give some examples of blessing and so on. And again, I get, I get these from anthropology. Well, this other one, this, this one, I got you from mysticism. But they say true maturity comes at the moment when we begin to die so as to give our seed away. It's interesting. If you look at a flower, when a flower is at its most beautiful, it's not at its most mature. You know, so imagine a flower and all of a sudden it, 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 it blooms and you have this spectacular, beautiful flower that's not its final moment of maturity. You know, um, it's its moment of beauty. It's its moment of its, its, its most beautiful energy and so on. But then the flower has to wither. And then when it withers and as it's dying and it's in its, its dying movement, it gives its seed away so that, you know, new flowers can, can grow. You know, mystics use that. John of the Cross uses this image very, very strongly, you know. So he said, the moment of our bloom is not the moment of our true true majority, maturity. Our moment of maturity is when, when we, in, in the death movement, which can go on for 20 years, the last 20 years of our lives, where we're giving our death away, or we're giving our seed away, you know, um, that, that's, that's the image of blessing. And, um, um, you know, it's interesting, anthropologists say that the, the, the thing with human beings is we can have children when we're 13 years old, you know, um, so we, <laughs> we, we can give our seed away, we can jet, just a life long before, uh, you know, we often have the maturity to do it. The second image is, is an image also from anthropology, and they, they, they call it the, the same, you know, what blessing does. And this is going to set up the images I'm going to give you. They said, blessing deconstructs, deconstructs the heart and the body. Okay, now, this is the image. And, and this one, I, 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 I've seen it many times in my life, but I, I never knew what it meant until anthropologists pointed it out to me, because I grew up on a farm. But have you ever watched a baby calf being born? Okay. When a baby calf comes out of its mother, it is completely paralyzed. And if the mother didn't do something, the calf would never move because there's a constricting afterbirth, like a glue. It's almost like the calf's body is glued together. But what happens is the mother gets up immediately and she licks every inch of that constricting afterbirth. She licks every inch off the calf's body and it takes some minutes, half an hour, whatever. And then as soon as she does that, the calf stands up and the calf tests its muscles and it begins to romp in the sun. So for a baby calf to be deconstructed in heart and body takes a half hour. For a human being, it can take a lifetime. You know, and you're gonna see what, what blessing does. When we're born, there's a, there's a constriction in our heart and, and it stays there until it's lifted. And uh, it's interesting, if, if you look at the literature that came out of what's best in masculine spirituality, from people like Robert Moore and Robert Bly and, and um, uh, Michael Mead and James Hillman and so on, they're very much on this. And they say, you know, men sense this. They say most men, I mean, men sense that they're, they're constricted inside. They deny it, of course. He said, but you know how men try to get out of that? Two ways, through achievement, I'm going to do something so spectacular. I'm going to win a Super Bowl. I'm going to make $100 million or something or through sex. And neither work. Neither work. It, it can only be lifted by, by blessing. Let me give you an example of that. I'm going to go into some, some examples of blessing. I have a friend who's a journalist, American, and, uh, and a very good one. Happily married, was raised a wonderful family. You know, he's, uh, and his wife, whom I know well, and she said that there was a defining moment in his life. She said, no, he's a good guy, you know. She said, um, but you know, we could never talk about deep things. Whenever I want to talk about deep things, I said, well, what, what do you want to talk about? So he was just killed the moment, you know. Uh, but he shares this now himself. He said one day, and he was already in his 40s, he was sitting at his desk, the newspaper, and he said, his boss came down, and his boss said, you know, Tom, I've never told this to you before, but I should have said this to you before. I said, you are just the best guy we've got. I said, it just felt something lift inside of you. He said, 
said, then my dad phoned. So my dad was in his seventies. He phoned and he says, you know, Tom, I should have told you this many years ago. He said, God, I'm proud of you. I'm just proud of you. The kids, your marriage and so on. Well, that night his wife couldn't shut him up. See, that's the mother licking the afterbirth off the son. And it, it works through blessing. Now, I want to give you some examples of blessings. First of all, two specifications uh, I can do quickly. First of all, blessings come from the top down. So God blesses the earth. The Pope blesses the church. The bishop blesses the diocese. You know, parents bless their children. Teachers bless the students. You know, the 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 Cubs leaders bless the little baby Cubs and so on. Uh, it's it's coming from the top where there's power. Okay, and also this not that's not mysterious. It's most powerful inside the same gender because it's hardest to do there. You know, uh, older men find it easier to bless younger women. Older women find it easier to bless younger men because we aren't a threat to each other. You know, uh, if I'm a man and, 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 a, and a, a really good looking young man walks in the room, that's a threat to me. It doesn't threaten the women. Vice versa, if you're a woman and, um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, this Hollywood star walks in the room that it, it's a threat. Shouldn't be, but it is, you know. Um, now, let, 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 me, let me tease this out with some examples. Examples of blessing. So let's take, take this example. Imagine this. And I'll pick on men first, okay. Imagine you are a teacher on a faculty. So you're teaching in a school. And you are a gifted teacher, okay? And for 20 years, everybody in the school, all the staff, and everybody knows you are the best teacher in the school, and deservedly so, you know? And you're a good heart at that, okay? But now you're in your 50s, and one day you come, the August beginning staff meeting, and into the room walks young Jack. And Jack is just a young George Clooney. He's six foot two, he has perfect hair, perfect teeth, perfect body, perfect attitude, perfect degrees. And you thought, where did I you order a guy like that from the catalog? You know, like, you see, he's perfect. And he's a nice guy besides. Now, how are the older men on faculty gonna react to, to young Jack? Are they gonna say, and you I take delight? No, they're gonna be threatened to hell. And you're the best teacher, you're gonna be threatened to hell. You're going to be like King Herod. I want to kill him. I want to kill him, except we do it more subtly. You know what we say? We're going to kill him. We say this. Yeah, he's young. He's idealistic. You know, let him put up with the bullshit for the next 30 years the way we did. When he gets to be my age, he'll be as jaded and jagged as I am. You know, see, that's King Herod. The wise men lay their gifts at the foot. Now, if you as an older man could walk over and say to Jack, God, I'm glad you're here. That you landed up in this school with all that you bring here and i know you're going to be the most popular teacher and i'm going to support you in absolutely every way i can you know something you would be setting him free but you'd also be setting yourself free it wouldn't be long and you'd be walking to your car maybe that very night and you'd say to yourself god it feels great to be alive because when you act like god you get to feel like god when we act like King Herod, we get to feel like King Herod, you know. Um, but it's hard to do, you know. Um, it, it's hard to to bless because that energy does threaten us, you know, and it's going to replace us. It's hard to let go, so it's hard to to bless young energy, and especially it doesn't always come pure. Maybe Jack isn't the nicest guy in the world. I remember doing this once with some priests. <laughs> in the Rockford Diocese up north of Chicago. And I did this whole day on blessing. And I said, you know, the, the old priest, you gotta bless the young priest. And one, one priest said, I'd like to bless the young priest. Said, but they don't wanna be blessed by me. They want me dead. He said, I love her. He said, why don't you just die and give me some room here, you know? See, that's when you have to do it, <laughs> you know? Um, see, it's easy to bless people who admire you, you know? If you're a teacher and someone's always said, God, you're the best teacher I ever had. Well, you're saying you, I take delight, you know, but it's hard to bless people whose energy threatens you. I want to tell just a couple of stories here and then I'm going to open it up for questions and so on. Uh, 
uh, from my own life, you know. Um, well, first of all, um, this, this, this is a story. It's not my own life, but it's, it's an example I know. So when I was provincial, provincial of our order in Western Canada, you know, um, and we had a priest called Henry. And Henry died in his 70s, actually died playing golf, had a heart attack and so on. But when we were young seminarians, you know, Henry would always, he bless us. We didn't realize at the time that's what he was doing, but he'd tell you, know, God, it's great you joined the army. It's God, I'm great that you know, and you know, where do you come from? Well, how are your studies going? God, it's great you're with us and so on. So anyway, I was provincial and Henry dies. Now, part of my job as provincial is to, is to get somebody to, to preach at his funeral. So usually you phone their classmates and who's going to preach. But I thought, no, I, Henry was special to me. I thought I want to have executive privilege here. But before I could phone anybody, three young priests phoned me and said, I want to preach at Henry's funeral. And I said, why? Well, they said, he blessed me. Well, that was just nothing. You know, you know, older priest scowling at me, he said, Henry would always find me, always bless me. So that's a blessing. I'll give you one other story on this too. Also, it was provincial. This story is almost humorous, but it, it's a great story. But uh, I was provincial of our order in Western Canada in 1995. And that's the year our founder was going to be can was canonized in Rome. So this was a big, big thing for us as oblates. Our founder is going to be canonized, okay? And um, so we'd all like to have gone to Rome, but we can't all go. We can't afford to send 100 people there and so on. Uh, so anyway, we had a meeting and we decided, well, our treasurer had sorted this out and said, 35, we can send 35 people. We're going to break the budget. 35 people can go by which 35? So we're going to run a lottery, okay? Put all the names in the hat. They started pulling out names. Jack's going, Tom's going, Bill's going, you know. And we're about halfway through this. And one of our priests in the 70s, George, great young guy, great one, wasn't a young guy, stood up and said, I'm against this. He said, I'm against this. He said, you know, just, I said, I, I know lotteries are biblical. He said, I just, let's not do this. He said, this is what we should do. He said, we should send the 35 youngest guys. He said, we should send the 35 youngest guys because they're the future. He said, I'm 70 years old. If I don't know what a charism, a little late for me. He said, it's not too late for them. We should send the 35 youngest guys. Well, another guy in his 70s stood up and says, I don't agree with that. He says, I was ordained 25 years before I ever got sent to Rome. He said, why should these young guys get to go to Rome? And Father George said, so they don't turn out like you and I. So they don't turn out like you and I. He says, that's the whole point. He says, we need to bless them. And that's what we ended up doing. We end up sending the 35 youngest guys. But notice in that you have King Herod and you have the wise man. The wise man said, send the young. King Herod said, why them? You know, um, I like his answer. So they don't turn out like you and I. I just want to share a couple of personal stories and then we'll, we'll go into um, questions on this. A personal being blessed. You know, when I was a, I, I still a seminarian. I was doing summers. I was doing a master's degree at the University of San Francisco. <clears throat> and one summer I took a course from Joseph Champlin, who was a liturgist and writer from Syracuse, New York, <clears throat> who was a very popular, he sold 9 million books and so on. But he was, a, he was an exceptional man, exceptional pedagogue and so on. And so I stayed vaguely in touch with him. And when I was provincial, I got him up to once to speak to our priests and so on. And, um, and then this was 2009, I think it was 2009, just before Christmas. Um, I get a phone call one day from his secretary in Syracuse. He says, Father, are you home tomorrow night? I said, yes, I am. He said, do you have a guest room? I said, yes, we do. He said, Father Joseph wants to fly out. He wants to talk to you, he wants to spend the night at your house. And uh, I said, okay, we'll set it up. So she gave me the times and so on. So he arrives about five o'clock, pick him up at the airport, you know, Bring him back. He said, well, he said, I need to rest a little bit. He said, I'm tired and maybe we can go for dinner at seven. So seven o'clock, we go out for dinner, take him to a restaurant. We sit down. He says this to me. He says, you know why I flew here to see you? I said, no, I don't. He said, because I'm dying. He said, I'm dying. I have cancer. I'm dying. And I want to bless you before I, before I die. He said, um, I met you when you were a young seminarian. I followed your works. He said, I just want to bless you, whatever spirit I can give you. And a month later, he died 
put him on the plane the next door. It meant a lot to me. You know, priest flies to New York. He said, I want to bless you before I die. Um, you know, meant a lot to me. Taught me a lot about things and so on. Or another occasion, we had a, a woman in Edmonton, a remarkable woman. She died young um, and also of cancer. And um, But she had a, a great spiritual reputation and, and deservedly. And I was living in Toronto in those years, and I got a letter from her one day, you know, it was before emails and so on. And she said, I want you to fly to Edmonton. She said, as I'm dying, I need to bless you. She also blessed a lot of people before I die. So I had an occasion, I went to Edmonton, went to her house, she had baked the cake. And then um, first of all, she read me a letter, which she had written for me, which she gave me. She said, you know, these are, I think, the qualities that, that God has given you. She says, and, and, uh, you, you need to, she said, I want to bless that. And then we ate this cake and I left. And two weeks later, she died, you know. Um, I thought, there's some lessons here. Um, and, um, you know, um, one last one, and then we'll have questions and so on. Some years ago, I really helped a young man, one of the students, the, the colleague I had, you know, I helped him in classroom and out of the classroom. And I kind of forgot about him. And just this year, at one point, I got an email from him. He's now living in a different country. And he's his father. He says, uh, he says, and I can quote him. He says, with every fiber of my being, I want to thank you for helping me like this. He said, you didn't have to, you know. Uh, that brought tears to my eyes, still does, you know. Um, see, those are the things that set us free. So in our adulthood, the deeper invitation to the gospel to to carry tension for other people and then also to bless as we get older um, um, to just make space for the young to bless young energy to not be threatened by it and to also at a certain point deliberately like the joseph chaplains and the woman in Edmonds name was linda davis people like that who just you know consciously explicitly say i want to bless people you know, um, and anybody who's been blessed like that knows what a powerful, um, it gives you spirit. It's like uh, Elijah and Elisha. Elisha is going away. Elijah said, don't go. And they said, okay, if you have to, he said, I want the double portion of your spirit. Just give me a double portion of your spirit. Uh, that's what we have to leave to others as, as, we, as we fade into the sunset. I want to leave you with a great poem from Henry Butler Yeats. Uh, William Butler Yeats. And this is part of a longer piece. And um, um, this is just a great piece, a piece called Vacillation. And, and when, whenever I, I quote Yeats, I like to quote a line from him. He once talked about another one of his friends who was Irish. Yeats was an Irish poet. He says, uh, he said, being Irish, he had an abiding sense of the tragic that helped sustain him through temporary happy periods in his lifetime. But this is a great piece. He says, my 50th year had come and gone, and I sat, a solitary man in a crowded London shop, an open book and an empty cup on a marble tabletop, while on the shop and street I gazed, my body of a sudden blazed. In 20 minutes, more or less, it seemed so great my happiness that I was blessed and could bless. 20 minutes, more or less, it seemed so great my happiness that I was blessed and could bless. Notice he's an older man. We don't know how old he is, long past 50. You know, he's sitting by himself, finished a cup of coffee in the shop, and my body of a sudden way said, God, it feels great to be alive. Not because I look like George Clooney anymore, but I'm an older man. I've been blessed and I can't bless. Okay, I want to leave you with that and we um, stop to share and we can go into some. Um, some questions um, the chat room or Joel I'll let you lead this section here thank you Father Ron uh, first question uh, this person asked just from talking about in that first section about pondering and amazement the question was Jesus amazed anywhere in the Bible in the Gospels no no uh, let, let me make an important distinction here see now they use the word amazement um, but um, th there is an English, th th we have another thing that, that's 
close, but it's the opposite. So that there's amazement is unhealthy, but there's something we call awe. You know, when somebody you're in awe of something, you know, see, and, and this is the difference. In amazement, the energy runs through you. In awe, the energy stops. Like like, the energy stuns you. You know, so um, it, it 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 paralyzes you in a way. Where where see that's the opposite of the energy. Crucify um, you know, uh, uh, and, and so on. Um, George Carlin, the, the the comedian, had a great line once. He said. Um, he said, you know, I, all these people are so over the top religiously. He said, they have a born again experience. He says, I never take them seriously. He said, you know why? He said, they talk too much. He said, when I was born the first time, I was so stunned I couldn't talk for two years. He said, when you, <laughs> when you have the experience, it, it should stun you. See, that's awe. That's healthy, you know. Um, so you, 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 you can be happily surprised, amazed. There, there can be a non-pejorative sense to amaze, amazement. But I'm talking about amazement as this, this energy of just energy flowing through you. Now it's neutral when you're at a football game or a baseball game or cheering for your, your favorite side. Uh, that's amazement, but it's, 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 it's neutral or, or good. But it's also the energy for crucifixion, for gang rapes, for ideology, for everything. Wonderful. Another question. In what sense does God have favorites? This person asks, in what sense does God have favorites? Well, you know, that's a good question. Because in, in Scripture, it, it tends to give that impression, you know, but that, that's a misreading. We are all God's favorites. Everybody's predestined. You know, when, when, um, when Paul says, he predestined those he loved and so on. So you get the impression like some are in us, some are out. No, it's everybody. It's everybody. So that, um, you know, God, God picks certain people for certain missions. So for instance, the chosen people, they were picked to be an instrument, you know, of salvation for other nations, but it doesn't make them God's favorite. God's favorite is everybody, you know? And I think that's very important, you know, uh, um, you know, not just religiously, but you know, when when um, when 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 certain nations or races or whatever think we're special, you know, God loves Canadians better than other people. No, you know, or we're we're a special nation for God. No, all the nations are special. Everybody's special, you know, or predestination. We're all predestined for heaven. Some might not accept the invitation, you know or go with the predestination, but everybody's loved, everybody's predestined, everybody's a favorite. That's a good question, because it, 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 today we always fall into that. Wonderful. Another question asks uh, from this individual, how does atonement theory relate to the blessing of God? How does atonement theory relate to the blessing of God? Okay, well, it, it, atonement theory, it, it relates, but let me first take it to the first thing. It also relates to the taking away the sins of the world, you know. Um, but, but first of all, when, whenever you have a, let me use a technical term and I'll explain it. Whenever you have a kind of a, a salvation motif, you know, or redemptive motif, is it, he paid the price for our sins. He took away the sins of the world. He atoned for our sins and so on. First of all, those are metaphors. Those are metaphors. And if they're taken literally, they actually become awful, you know. Um, see, we, we, we can't think of God sin, and then we can't go to heaven till the son comes and he makes his son suffer and that somehow pays the debt to the father and so on. That's metaphorical, you know. And um, so if you take that atonement language literally it's 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 not good you know it turns god into um into a pretty petty person and so on um so those are rich imageries those, those so that um so that um, they're metaphors so you can metaphorically atone for instance a, a mother who says i'm 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 offering my suffering for my son who's a, who's an idiot out on the street and so on um you know, she's atoning in a way for her son's sins, but not like God keeps them, 
divine credit union going and so on. But now how it relates to blessing, you know, I, I'm suspecting that what, what might be behind the question is, you know, if everything's good and God is saying it's good, it's good, why would there have to be any atonement, you know? Um, well, in fact, that's a good question. Um, we're good, um, but but we're, we're 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 far from perfect, and so that uh, um, so God is still smiling on us, but God isn't smiling on what we're doing wrong. You know, let me let tease that with a parent. Imagine you're a parent, and you you love your kids to death. Okay, you love them all the time. Say, God, they're good kids. At times, they're going to do some pretty stupid things that are going to get a little upset. You don't stop loving them. You don't stop saying they're good kids. You know, you're saying, well, that was dumb. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, so that, see, so God still sees us and the world as good. We're not corrupt, you know, but it doesn't mean there aren't things that we, that we don't need to atone for, you know. So the blessing's always there. Um, and in fact, it's, it's the blessing that does the atonement you know, Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, she used to pray, she said to God, she says, when she did something wrong, she said, punish me with a kiss. It's a wonderful expression, punish me with a kiss. You know, when you do something wrong and love breaks through to you in spite of that, that more than anything else is what matures you and brings you along, you know. Uh, if you do something wrong, you get punished for it, that's tit for tat. You learn a lesson, say, I'm going to know better next time. You don't move along in the love ladder, you know. Uh, but if you get punished with a kiss, it moves you to a different moral place. That's a good question. Thanks. A couple of questions that uh, around the same uh, idea. Uh, again, that blessing that you spoke about, these two individuals, their question, uh, how do we handle the memory of a, dead parent who didn't bless us you know how can we feel blessed from deceased parents who were maybe more critical uh this second part perhaps they too were never blessed and couldn't blessed uh you relate the story of daniel berrigan should daniel berrigan have taken a different attitude toward his father who didn't maybe bless him you know that that that's the million dollar question okay if you haven't been blessed by a parent um, and they die, well, then they're dead, you know. Um, you know, in, 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 when I was going doing a lot of the studying with, with Robert Moore and these people on, on, uh, on masculine spirituality, that question came up a lot, or Richard Rohr does a lot with that. So they say, well, you can't, they say the root out of it, remember the last line of this poem, I was blessed and could bless. Maybe you weren't blessed, but if you start blessing others, that's going to be compensatory for that. That that the healing comes in you blessing others, you know, um, or sometimes after they're dead, we realize that in their own way how they were wounded and why they couldn't bless us, and we're able to forgive that, you know, because usually that you know, um, people like like his his dad, they weren't bad people. Obviously, he had been cursed a lot in his life, and it, he found it hard to bless his sons, you know. But see, in that autobiography, he can also forgive his dad, saying, you know, well, that was my dad, and he had a rough life. And, um, you know, see that a lot of times, death also washes a lot of things clean. And sometimes, you know, you can, we can forgive people, um, you know, after they're dead, because we, we see it more clearly, why they did the things they did, and they really couldn't help themselves. I have a question, if you might be able to speak a little bit more, elaborate on how true maturity comes when we begin to die. Just to elaborate a bit more on true maturity and how that comes about when we begin to die. Well, again, that, that's a big question. You know, right now we, we have a, a living school here called Forest Dwelling, and the Forest Dwelling is exactly the whole school is about this, you know. Now, some of it comes, let me just give some broad strokes. Some of it comes conscriptively, you know, as we age and there's necessary diminishments in our health and our social status and so on, there is simply a necessary letting go, whether we want to or not, you know. 
Um, you know, when you're 70, you're not 20. And, uh, and so on, and we're tired, we get pushed out, you know, and so on. And then it can get worse for an assisted living, health issues, and so on. Um, so that these are the flower, the bloom is gone. It offers us that opportunity then to say now, um, you know, I don't compete with young energy more. I bless it. You know, when, in fact, used to the expression, when you're young, you're unconsciously in competition with all the energy around you. If you're a man, you're in, co you're in competition with all the other men. If you're a woman, you're in competition with the other women, you know, um, and, and you can't help it, you know. But when you're 70, you say, I'm not going to try to com compete with this 20-year-old girl anymore. She's, she's got a body that, you know, I don't have anymore. So instead of having that energy threaten me, I'm going to bless it. I'm going to tell every young girl I see, I say, God, you're gorgeous. And it's wonderful that somebody will use on earth, you know. Um, you know, and the same with men. See, so that um, the opportunities there, because we're, we're literally, our diminishments push us out. And they also make us more helpless so that um, um, we have to let other people help us more. Uh, but this is hard. That's why I said it's, it's the, the final bit of mature, is mature. You see that in great mature people, you know, uh, you know, that... Um, we just say, you know, like, I've had my day, and it was a good run, but now all I want to do is to try to make help everybody I can before I die. You know, it, some of this comes naturally. You know where it comes naturally? It comes naturally to grandparents. That uh, some of you out there are grandparents. They say it's the greatest experience on the planet. It's the purest love there is. It's not between a husband and a wife. You know, it's between or, or you and your children. There's always tensions there. With grandchildren, it's just pure. It's just pure, and um, um, and it's interesting. A lot of a lot of fathers who can't bless their sons can bless their grand grandsons. You know, a lot of mothers who struggle to bless their daughters can bless their granddaughters. You know, um, and um, so so some of it just some of this happens naturally. But 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 your question it's such a huge question. We we have a school. And there's, there's a lot of good literature being written right now on this. Wonderful, Father. Would there be uh, any feminine spiritual teachers or guides who you could recommend for this process? Any feminine spiritual teachers or guides? Yes. And, you know, in fact, some of the best ones are... are, are, are um, I want to recommend a couple of people. Um, there's a woman, she's in Berkeley... And actually, she's just joined our faculty for this for the forest dwelling called Marilyn Chandler McIntyre, but McIntyre with an E. Marilyn Chandler McIntyre. Look it up when they know. She's written some fine books on this. And then a woman who just died two years ago, who we had signed up, she was going to join our faculty out of Florida, Kathleen Dowling Singh. And Singh is with a S I N G with an H on the end. She's written three books. The Grace in Living, The Grace in Aging, The Grace in Dying. Um, uh, and that trilogy is one of the best things that, that, that's been written of this. You also have secular literature. Um, re let me recommend, uh, recommend a couple of books. Um, uh, what, what, what's her name now? Um, well, well, let, let me, there, there's a book called, uh, by, uh, called by Annie Riggs called The Bright Light, Annie Riggs, The Bright Light. Um, she's a young woman. She died at age 38 a couple of years ago. And this is really a, a book she wrote the last two years when she was dying. And it's just a, a powerful book. Um, she doesn't come out of perspective of faith. And it's probably the best stoic, um, beautiful stoic book I've read, you know, she, how she faces her diminishment and letting go with grace, with humor, with wit, with um, an implicit faith that, that can shame a lot of us who have deep faith, you know. Um, now, the secular book I was trying to think, Erica Young, you know, who wrote um, Fear of Flying. She wrote a book called Fear of Dying, which is not a bad book at all, you know. Um, and um, this other one is, uh, I can't think of the, the author, but the title is called uh, the Violet Light, and it's 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 written by a woman, 
and she 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 takes stories of famous people from Freud through um, um, Jung through um, John Updike you, um, and people and, and women when, who are famous people dying and how they died and and um, and how they were able to, to, to give life at the end. Uh, that's also a good book. It's called The Violet Light. Very good. Previously, Father, you spoke about lying as a a single most dangerous thing we can do and and talked about what follows from that, how death dealing it is, and then yeah. tonight speaking about you know transformation and and blessings. So with tonight sharing, how do we hold the tension that ensues from that and transform it from lying? How would how would we hold the tension that ensues from that and transform it? Well, I, the, the, it's a double barrel question. You talk about how uh, our, how we deal with lies in our culture or how we deal with our own propensity for lying, you know. Um, see, let, let, let me just answer it from two angles, you know. See, how we deal with lying in our culture, because right now it's a big issue on all sides, you know, like uh, we're not sure two plus two equals four anymore and so on. Um, but see there, there's two things. We have to morally hold our own ground and tell the truth, but then we have to absorb some of this, you know, instead of, you know, preaching hatred and stupidity and so on, we got to, like Mary, sometimes we just have to, you know, see, darkness is having its hour, you know, and I'm not going to give back in kind, you know, lying within ourselves, you know, because we have a propensity to, to self protect, you know, um, you know, truth can be very inconvenient. And sometimes, you know, we, we call it a white lie or whatever kind of lie. It's, it, you know, it's, it, it's precisely the refusal to handle tension, you know, see, we, we lie because it's convenient, and resolves the tension, you know, um, where you say, you know, like if, if I tell the truth, it's going to get very awkward. I have to wear or you know, something. I, I want to, I'm just going to tell a lie, you know, see that as a way of avoiding tension. So um, the first part said, you know, the, the, the tension is something we should expect in life. And, uh, and, and, and uh, our job is to, to eat it, to transform it. You know, somebody just put it that, that Kathy Ropi, the violet light. Thank you. And, uh... Very good. Um, this person asks, what are some of the ways we can get to love when we would rather hate or bless when we would want to curse, offer graciousness and shake off bitterness, and offer affirmation when we feel jealous? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because, you know, it, it's going to give me a chance to explain that this isn't a simple, easy, once-off kind of a thing. And, and today, sometimes, you know, and I'm going to be critical here, sometimes spiritual books make it sound, you can just do this. We'll just do it, you know, just grow up. No, if we could, we would, you know. This is a lifelong process with lots of struggle. And at, at times, also, you have to give yourself permission to be angry for a while, you know. So you can't just turn off an emotion. You can't just, you know, I said, well, I don't hate this person. I don't hate him. No, you hate him, you know, See, or, or I'm not angry. You know, you got to process that, you know. I've had people come to me in confession or elsewhere where their knuckles were white and they said, and I'm not angry. I thought, well, you know, you are, you know, <laughs> or people say, sitting in church and say, I'm not bored. Yes, you're bored, you know. See, so the, the first thing is to own the feeling, you know, and to honor it. You know, um, you know, you know, so, so your, your, your feelings are like wild horses. They come and they teach you things about yourself, but you have to honor them and process them, you know, and if you, if you push them away without dealing with them, they're going to come, they're going to, you know, circle back and snake bite you, you know? So at times you have to, you have to say, yeah, I'm full of hate. I'm full of bitterness. I'm, you know, I'm angry and, and just owning it and expressing and explicit hating it is already helpful, you know? Because then you're taking control of it, you know, it's like an alcoholic says, I have an alcoholic problem, then he or she can take control of it, you know, it's when I say, no, I, I'm not a hateful person, I, I don't hold grudges, I'm, I, I, 
I don't get angry. You know, all of that's a lie. You know, I don't get bored in church. <laughs> See, for, first of all, accept the feelings, you know, and, um, um, and, and sometimes you might even have to um, ritualize, you know, um, psychologists and stuff do it, you know, ritualize hatred and anger, right? Just say like, you know, uh, I'm so angry, I'm going to punch somebody, I got to hit somebody and so on. Um, so that, um, but, but work with the feeling and, and see, as long as you know, that's not where you should be, eventually you're going to get to the other side. See, as long as we don't get comfortable, you no, know, everybody else hates. So I hate too, you know, uh, just, I don't care if I'm angry and so on. See, then the disease is incurable because you don't want to be cured. As long as we know, I don't want to be here. I don't want to have these feelings. I don't want to be filled with hate and so on. You will be, but you're already, uh, you know, we had a Catholic thing for them, the old Catholic catechism, and they had a lot of wisdom to it. You know, I'm glad I had to memorize those catechisms as a kid. And they had, they called that imperfect contrition. And this, this is a wonderful expression to imperfect contrition to say like, when you do something wrong or doing something wrong, you should feel bad about it. But sometimes you can't. Sometimes you're bloody happy that it, you know, they said, well, then you, you should feel if you can be sorry that you're not sorry, that's imperfect contrition is enough to forgive the sin. Sometimes you can't be sorry. They said, then you have to be sorry that you're not sorry. That's imperfect contrition. Um, you know that. And as long as we have that, as long as somebody says, you know, there's too much hate in my life. There's too much anger in my life. Um, you're still healthy. Let me give you one last thing. I'm looking at the clock here, but this is important. You know, with um, the theology or spirituality of Sabbath in scripture, we've never been taught a lot of that. But you don't know, see so that there's supposed to be this rhythm in time that you work for six days and then you have one day of Sabbath. You work for seven years and you have one year of Sabbath, sabbatical. You work for 49 years, you have a, you know, a jubilee year and then you work for a lifetime and eternity sabbatical that's also the pattern for forgiveness in judaism which jesus the, the, the idea was you could hold a grudge a little grudge for six days you have to let it go you could hold a major grudge for seven years and then you have to let it go that's where a statute of limitations comes from you could hold a soul searing grudge for 49 years you have to let it go and you could hold something that just cut your heart out until your deathbed, but then you have to let it go. But notice there's a lot of psychological wisdom in there, you know. Sometimes you gotta pout for six days. Sometimes you're gonna be hurt for seven years. Sometimes you might have somebody cut your soul out of you. It may take 49 years for that to, you know, see it. And sometimes contemporary spirituality, sometimes they, they try to force it, you know. Uh, deliver the baby. No, you gotta just stay for a long time. That's an important question. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Father Ron. And we want to thank everyone for their questions tonight. Uh, we've listed a few of the resources that Father Ron has mentioned, the book resources in the uh, chat there. So we might take note of those to pursue those further. But we thank you, Father Ron, for your uh, lecture tonight and these uh, three nights that we've spent together, these deeper in invitations inside the gospel. Tonight, the invitation to, to bless and to transform and the difficulty that surrounds that. We thank everyone for your, their participation tonight and all these nights. Um, we'd mentioned that these this, this lecture tonight and the other two nights will be available in about a month on the schools on the OST YouTube channel. And so that's listed in your chat as well. So we thank you for your participation, your attendance tonight, and we wish you a good night and God's blessings. Good night. Thank you all. Thanks.